but I do history people today in history with memes. We're taking a look at the Roaring Twenties, so let's go ahead and get started. By 1920, a majority of the U.S. population lived in urban centers, which offered new economic opportunities for women, international migrants, and internal migrants. And of course, a big reason why people are moving to these urban centers is because of those economic opportunities. Women got new opportunities because of the war, because of new technology. You had people coming in from different countries and you have these migrations happening internally in the United States. Now with this, there's going to be clashes over the goals and values of the different regions, urban versus rural. That's gonna be a big theme in the 1920s. New technologies and manufacturing techniques helped focus the U.S. economy on the production of consumer goods, contributing to improved standards of living, greater personal mobility, and better communications systems. So symbolizing the 1920s is all this new technology. Needless to say, there's a learning curve with this new technology. It creates opportunities, but it also creates challenges as life is changing so rapidly. Another important idea of the 20s is this idea of consumer goods. People are buying things not because they need them, but because they want them. And, and in the 20s, you have all sorts of new stuff that's available, like the radio, the washing machine, the Model T, stuff that is becoming affordable for the average American. Now, this does improve the standard of living for many Americans in the 1920s. Personal mobility is greater in the decade. Now, if you couldn't afford all these new consumer goods, there was a new way of purchasing things on credit, buying these consumer goods with the installment plan. And better communication systems is everything from the telephone kind of becoming much more widespread and common and affordable for many Americans, especially in urban areas, but also the rise of the radio and other forms of technology. Speaking of this technology, new forms of mass media such as radio and cinema contributed to the spread of national culture as well as greater awareness of regional cultures. So you have this kind of spread of the radio and the movies kind of uniting the country together into these shared experiences. You know, everyone is able to listen to the same news, the same forms of entertainment, the same commercials. And not only are people are enjoying the same entertainment and news, they're also kind of starting to speak the same, this rise of a national culture and you could see this in the slang of the 1920s calling someone who's boring a flat tire or someone who's real swell the bees knees or things like moonshine or bootlegging all of these words are spread with these new forms of mass media migration gave rise to new forms of art and literature that express ethnic and regional identities such as the harlem renaissance you know harlem renaissance is so much more than jazz music but jazz is a central part of this it's also poetry and literature and things like this and so you get this rise of these different forms of artistic expression. Now my favorite part of the 1920s is this. In the 1920s, cultural and political controversies emerged as Americans debated gender roles, modernism, science, religion, and issues related to race and immigration. So you got this roaring 20s, but underneath that you have these kind of tensions and conflicts that are developing. First kind of big one is gender roles. Remember, women start off the decade with the right to vote, the 19th Amendment. The most common image of women in the 1920s is that of the flapper, kind of breaking down traditional gender roles, and there's a reaction to that. But keep in mind, most women are not kind of participating in this kind of flapper culture. They're too busy trying to survive in America. Another important idea of the 20s is this kind of tension between modern versus traditional, science versus religion. And the best example of this takes place in Dayton, Tennessee during the Scopes monkey trial where John Scopes is arrested and you have the radio broadcasting the trial to an international audience. So the rise of fundamentalism reacting to a lot of these changes of the 1920s. And of course, you have the issues of race and immigration. And ironically enough, the 1920s also sees a resurgence of the KKK kind of broadening their messaging to include also speaking out against immigration, Catholics, and a whole bunch of other groups that are not white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant. And of course, you can't talk about the 1920s without talking about all the debates that center around prohibition and the 18th Amendment. And we all know that prohibition was in many ways a failed experiment because many people violated the 18th Amendment, and you have the rise of speakeasies, mobsters like Al Capone, and widespread lawlessness as people became comfortable with breaking the law. And another point to keep in mind is, as Americans are debating all these issues, you have this group of writers and intellectuals called the Lost Generation, people like F. Scott Fitzgerald, who are not only critiquing the rise of, you know, fundamentalist and traditional small town values, but they're also critiquing this consumer culture that the decade gives rise to. 
Immigration from Europe reached its peak in the years before World War I. During and after World War I, nativist campaigns against some ethnic groups led to the passage of quotas that restricted immigration, particularly from Southern and Eastern Europe, and increased barriers to Asian immigration. So you have this rise of nativism specifically directed at those Southern and Eastern European immigrants. So we had this massive immigration taking place during the Second Industrial Revolution, but you see the rise of nativist campaigns trying to restrict those immigrants who are from Southern Eastern Europe, places like Poland and Russia and Greece and so on. And so you get in the 1920s, the National Origins Act or the National Quota Act of 1924 with the goal of these quotas of trying to limit the number of immigrants coming from these so-called undesirable regions of Europe. In the 1920s, you see the tightening of barriers to Asian immigration. We already saw previously the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1883, the Gentlemen's Agreement, which restricted Japanese immigrants. So there continues to be an even more intense nativism towards Asian immigrants and Asian immigration. Most famously, the nativist campaigns and kind of mood of the 1920s can be seen in the trial of Sacco and Benzetti, two Italian immigrants who were anti-war, they were anarchists, and many feel that they did not receive a fair trial because of their beliefs, their political beliefs, and their ethnicity, and as a result, they're both executed. And finally, make sure you know in the years following World War I, the U.S. pursued a unilateral foreign policy that used international investment peace treaties and select military intervention to promote a vision of international order even while maintaining U.S. isolationism. So after World War I, you all know the story, we don't join the League of Nations, and we do some things on the foreign stage, that's why it's called a unilateral foreign policy, but we do so only on our terms. So we have the Dawes Plan, the Washington Naval Arms Conference, the Kellogg-Briand Pact, but largely in the 1920s, we pursue a U.S isolationist foreign policy. Now, if you want to know more details and get more specific, you can check out the Roaring Twenties video. The link is in the description. And of course, we have the website apushexplained.com for all your history and government needs. We also have slides for all the videos there so you don't have to write everything down. And as always, make sure you have a beautiful day. Thanks for watching. Peace.